All right. Um, it, it, that's, it truly, I have already had a night like that, everyone. I've uh, managed to schedule two open houses for the same night. And I just, uh, just came from one here at Chesterton Academy in the Twin Cities. And uh, I'm happy to join you and have you join with us, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Andrew Youngblood, who is the uh, headmaster of Chesterton uh, Koryesu, our new online um, uh, Chesterton Academy. And also he's the director of curriculum and instruction for the Chesterton Schools Network. And then Nancy Brown joining us, who has just stepped on as our program director for Chesterton Koryesu. Uh, later on, uh, Amy Hunt will be joining us uh, as soon as she's able to, and uh, she'll be joining our discussion. It will be a, a discussion, and uh, that, that I think will be helpful for everyone participating. We'll talk about it in just a minute, but uh, I'd like to begin with a, uh, a prayer for the intercession of G.K. Chesterton. So please join me in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, you filled the life of your servant, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, with a sense of wonder and joy and gave him a faith which was the foundation of his ceaseless work, a charity towards all men, particularly his opponents, and a hope which sprang from his lifelong gratitude for the gift of human life. May his innocence and his laughter, his constancy in fighting for the Christian faith in a world losing belief, his lifelong devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and his love for all men, especially for the poor, bring cheerfulness to those in despair, conviction and warmth to lukewarm believers, and the knowledge of God to those without faith. We beg you to grant the favors we ask through his intercession, particularly for parents and students of, uh, who are in school right now, that they will be given hope and be given the instruction that they deserve to become leaders and strength in uh, our present broken society. So that his holiness may be recognized by all and the church may proclaim him blessed. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Well, once again, everyone, thank you for joining us. It is a busy night. We know that we're up against um, the President of the United States and the uh, <laughs> Republican National Convention. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, but what we're talking about tonight, I think, concerns us even more immediately uh, than the than, than national events, because we're talking about our children. And uh, that is the most important thing we have, are, are the souls of our children. And the, taking care of that is the greatest duty that we have. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that... Um, you know, some of you will be tuning into the highlights of the Republican National Convention later, and some of you will be watching this on a, in a recording uh, the, the, after the event. Either way, uh, it's great to have you part of it because you are already getting tired of hearing that this is a time of uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> Unprecedented time. Unprecedented. <laughs> Unprecedented uncertainty. And as a matter of fact, you know, one of the reasons we held this event this evening was because we are aware that many parents still have not made the decision of, of where they're going to be sending their kids to school this fall uh, because, because of all the uncertainty. We, they don't know if their school is going to be open, and they don't know the status of the school, if, if it's going to be worth investing in. They just don't know what to do. And uh, where you send your, your child to high school is certainly one of the most important decisions you make. They're they are more formed in a critical way at the high school level, even than in college. And, uh, and of course, what happens to them in college will so much be determined by how they've been prepared for college in high school. And so we wanna to talk to you uh, about the fact that even though we are facing this giant crisis, and even, even as we were referring to just earlier before we, we went uh, to the official uh, start of this meeting, the last time we had a, a presentation like this about Chesterton Schools Network was during rioting here in Minneapolis. Well, tonight, 
they're rioting again in Minneapolis. We have a curfew tonight. The world's falling apart, my friends. It's falling apart. And, the, and we have to start rebuilding it right now. We are already rebuilding a civilization that is crumbling. We have, we're getting a head start on it. And that rebuilding process is not gonna be from the top down. It's gonna be from the bottom up. It's a grassroots uh, project. And we are excited to be part of it. It's, it's an exciting time to be part of high school education. Uh, because we really do have some solutions to offer the world. Many of you uh, know of, of, of good schools around you, uh, and I hope you're taking advantage of those. There are other online options. Uh, there's homeschool connections, an excellent Catholic homeschool online uh, uh, way of helping homeschool educators. Uh, but we're going to talk to you tonight about what we're doing with the Chesterton Schools Network, and, and specifically with Chesterton Koryesu, our, our online uh, high school uh, that for, for the homeschoolers. We're going to talk about some practical points tonight about how to, uh, how to get involved in your child's education, because you have to get involved. People ask me, well, you know, Dale, you seem to have had some success at getting involved in your in your children's high school education. And I said, well, yeah, I started a high school. <laughs> and the point is, you can start a high school. If you're a homeschool educator, you are starting a high school. Uh, and, and you get to run the high school. You get to be directly involved in your child's education. And, and we have a way of helping you. And that's the point is we are here to help. We, we know that, that parents have to take control of their child's education but they feel a little overmatched by it. We are here to help. Why? Because we are parents ourselves and uh, we've, we've had some success and some, some measurable success at doing what we're doing. Uh, we know what your concerns are because they're the same concerns that we have. So, um, so we're gonna uh, be, and, and when I say about success, Look, we started Chester Academy 12 years ago with 10 students sitting around one table. And they were 10 of the most miserable looking creatures I'd ever seen. <laughs> but they, uh, they were part of something that was really revolutionary because now 12 years later, there are 33 schools in the Chesterton Schools Network. And there are more that are getting started because uh, this, this particular program really is effective. We have a model that works. And, uh, and so we're gonna, we're gonna take you through that. Why Chesterton? Who's Chesterton? I'm sure that you're here because you've heard of G.K. Chesterton, but he lived 100 years ago and had a very prophetic uh, insight into what's going on in our world. He knew why we are facing the crumbling situation that we're facing right now. It's because of the attack on the family, the attack on faith, the attack on reason. And so we need uh, to restore the faith, restore reason, and restore the family. And this is a family-based uh, educational system that uh, really, really does glorify uh, the basic unit of society. Chesterton said, the one thing that is never taught in any of our public schools is this, that there is a whole truth of things and that in knowing it and speaking it, we are happy. You know, if he'd only said just that, that would be enough to make him justifiably immortal because he absolutely nailed the problem with our public school system. We don't teach the whole truth of things. And that by all, also, we, by not teaching it, we don't teach our children how to be able to express it. And so expressing it, being able to say what the whole truth of things is, will make them happy. It'll give them peace and confidence in a world that's falling apart, in a world that's filled with unreason and doubt and skepticism and despair. 
Another great line of Chesterton's is uh, one of his most famous lines, a thing worth doing is worth doing badly. It's always misunderstood. It's always used as, a, as an excuse for, uh, for not doing things the best you can and for accepting something uh, less than what we could have done. But what it is, it's, a, it's, it's the, the glorification of the amateur. The amateur does something because literally they are lovers. They love what they're doing. And they may not do it as well as a professional, but the fact, the fact that they're doing it out of love makes it worth doing. And parenting is an amateur sport. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is absolutely worth doing. Even when we don't do it as well as we, even if we don't do it as well as we should and can, it's still worth doing. But we're gonna always rise to that higher standard. Two other great lines of Chesterton's. There is no such thing on earth as an uninteresting subject. The only thing that can exist is an uninterested person. That's got to be sort of the byline for education. When a student says, I'm bored, Chesterton says, there's no excuse for ever saying that you're bored because there's no such thing as a boring subject. There's only bored people. And if they're not interested, it's because they haven't taken the active role in being interested in, in what there is. The world is full of wonder, and we have to always spark that sense of wonder in students, in everything that they, that they study. They have to be anxious to discover the mystery, anxious to discover what's around the corner. And finally, other great line of Chesterton, angels can fly because they can take themselves lightly. Uh, it's, it should be a self-explanatory line that we excel when we are humble, when we do not take ourselves seriously. We need to give joy to our families, to our students, to the schools, because joy will lift us. And joy is only possible with a heavy dose of humility. So I would like to uh, keep our discussion going with uh, our panelists. We've just been joined by Amy Hunt. Amy, good to see you. She is the uh, Vice President of Formation for the Chesterton Schools Network. And since you have just stepped into uh, the, uh, the panelists, I'm gonna start by putting a, some questions to you right away, please, Amy. Bring it on, Dale. All right. <laughs> so you are, as a director of formation, that is intellectual, spiritual, and uh, character formation, all those things. Those three things are missing in various degrees from most schools. Tell us about what our approach is to formation and why it's so important. Well, thank you for that question, Dale. And it's one that I love to talk about because it's one of the things that I'm most excited about with the Chesterton curriculum. So we actually like to say that we do spiritual, intellectual, and moral formation. And in that order, because we, you know, what we are educating is the whole person. And we, and we start with, with the spiritual formation. And so um, with, you know, with everything from our, our chaplaincy program to retreats and pilgrimages, and, and of course, daily mass and the sacraments, we are really seeking to help those young people develop, um, to recognize that they are embodied spirits, that they have a soul and that we are, we, we are in them with, we are with them in this journey to um, perfect our souls. And so then the intellectual formation, of course, an incredibly rigorous curriculum, which I'm sure our, our uh, headmaster and director of curriculum, Andrew Youngblood, will um, get into more later. Um, but uh, we know that it's knowledge is good. It pleases the human person to know things. Um, Aristotle says that, you know, we, we are born to know. Every man wants to know the truth, every person. Uh, and then with moral formation and character formation, which is so important, uh, because we we are we are educating young people to have wonderful, um, vibrant lives, but also to be 
great citizens and to contribute to um, to our our communities. And um, even even now, as we enter a political um, season, we know that uh, for democracies to work, it, it's grounded in the idea of a virtuous society. And so we are we are educating our young people to fill to fill all those roles and to to be their fullest selves, which is um, the integration of all three of those elements of the soul, the mind, and then their um, their their moral uh, choices. Thank you, Amy. You know, when people are watching tonight, they may not know when looking at at this this beautiful woman here that she just retired as a commander from the U.S. Navy, uh, and she was uh, with the Navy SEALs to boot. So. Um, Tell us a little bit about how your naval experience, how you're bringing some of that to the formation of our students, to the, to the network. I think that's fascinating. <laughs> yes, well, you know, it's funny because I was just thinking about this when I was think, thinking, reflecting on the intellectual, the spiritual, moral, and intellectual formation. And in fact, the military does a version of this. So of course they, they train us um, to be, they train our minds and, our, and they give us knowledge, they train our bodies, um, but they also recognize that we have spirits and they've always provided, the military has always provided a chaplaincy program. And so it, it, be, it comes very natural to me then, having been formed in that environment, um, to recognize that all people need that and especially our young people. So um, I did do a lot of training while I was in the military. I was in charge of training programs on an aircraft carrier. I was in, I was in charge of the training of 3,000 sailors um, at sea. And I also helped train as a drill instructor, new officers coming into the Navy. So a uh, little bit of different methodology for sure, but also you know that idea that we are really um, forming people in um, to be excellent at what they do, and to be of, of good, strong moral character. Amy, can you give us a few practical tips for parents, especially who are homeschooling their, their students? What, what are some practical things they can do to work on formation in their students? Great question. Um, so I, what I love about our curriculum is that we are teaching young people about to, to reflect on the great ideas, so the, the big things in life. And what's wonderful is that those ideas often spill over into um, home life and, and around the dinner table. So my first recommendation would be to really use that family time uh, at the dinner table to engage your students about, you know, what are they learning? What excites them? Um, some of them may go through an argumentative stage where they want to challenge ideas and that's great you know let them allow them to do that as, as long as they can support their position and they they can provide the evidence of, of their um, why they think that way um so that would be the first thing and also if if any parents are out there are like me they probably have felt that their own education was deficient in in um, certain regards and use this opportunity as a chance to um, catch up on some of your own learning. Uh, I think one great thing to do is join your students in their summer reading. Good. Our students read, our ninth graders um, will read Edith um, Hamilton's mythology. And so I thought it would be a good idea if I read it myself. So that's currently what I'm reading. So those are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the dinner table is a great example of uh, of formation because uh, it's one of those things that's being lost in our culture today. Pe families are forgetting to have dinner together. For, they're, they're running in six different directions and sometimes it's f only four people that are running in six different directions. And uh, that time uh, at the dinner table is, is so important for not only knitting the family close together, but certainly for, uh, for the minds to be explored and and realize that everybody has a, a valid uh, contribution to make and, and, and their ideas need to be examined. Uh, it, it, I think it's a, something that we, it's a simple thing to do that we forget to remind ourselves how important it is, that family dinner. Yeah. 
Well, great. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to pass the thing on now to uh, to Andrew Youngblood. I have some some questions for you, Andrew. First of all, um, we haven't really talked much yet about the importance of a classical education, and uh, you know, you are the director of curriculum. Talk about why our classical curriculum is so important. I, I'm excited to talk about that. Can I segue back to what you were just talking about with M, with Amy? Because yeah, I, I was absolutely. I, I wanted to, sorry to um, throw that in there, but I was also oh. thinking one of the beautiful things about homeschooling is you you do have that community with the family, and I think you celebrate that when you are doing liturgy together or when you are doing um, you know the the family dinner. Those rituals are so important. But another thing that I really enjoyed, and, and I homeschooled for several years is uh, creating community um, with other families, bringing them in. And there are a couple of things about that that I really thought were beneficial for our children. And one of them was that um, we had multiple ages in the household. And if when you stop to think about the fact that we put all 14 year olds in the same room together, it's like, how did anyone ever come up with that idea? You know, it's just like, why, why, why are we putting a room full of 14 year olds together of, of all things, right? And I just remember I had, we were homeschooling and, and there was this one young gentleman and uh, he was just entering high school and he really started to go through sort of a dark phase. He, he wasn't really talking, looked a little bit glum. And um, my youngest was two at the time and she loved him. She still loves him to this day. Um, we're still good friends with all these families and she would sit on his lap while he did his math and he was you know sulky teenager and then after a year or so he just snapped out of it and he was just and ever since then he's just been blossoming and flourishing and just a wonderful wonderful young man and I really want you know it, it's hard to say cause and effect right but I just wonder what effect it had on him in being allowed to be more vulnerable because of the presence of younger kids. I feel like sometimes when, when high schoolers are by together, they, they kind of shell up a little bit. So I just think that if, if you are homeschooling, one of the benefits is creating those multi-age environments. And I think it's really beneficial. Some kids love talking to parents and, and they just love the, the adult perspective. You know, So when, when we're out in the world, we're not all you know, we're not all the same age. We don't work with people the same age, you know, just in the office, you know, working with Nancy and Amy and Kendra and Adrian, you know, we have people from, you know, right out of college and um, much older than that, right? So like, it's a spectrum, but it's so much fun to work much together. Older, and I think that that's really, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it makes for, it's a lot of fun. So that, well, I would just say that with regard to building community. Yes, definitely the household, but also, you know, bringing people into the household that, that really reinforce that notion and creating that multi-age environment. But you asked about classical. Yeah, but before I let you answer it, I'm going to segue back again. Before I ask, let you answer Wait, question. You're segueing my segue? Yeah, I'm, seg I'm segueing your segue. I want to segue back to Nancy Brown, who uh, also was a homeschool educator for many years. Could you give us a couple practical tips uh, building on what we've just heard? Oh, well, sure. I mean, one of the one of the things that we did in our family that I always loved was reading out loud mm -hmm. to our children. And one of the reasons I loved it was because it would always bring up things. What does that word mean? What is this person doing in this story? Why are they acting this way and not that way? And I think reading out loud together with your children, it, and sometimes depending on their age, you can even read one good book to a multiple group of multiple ages. And then you have this shared story going on in your family. You can talk about all of the good that's going on in the story. Maybe some of the bad characters, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? So reading out loud together is, is just one of those tips that I think is essential for the family. Great. Um, okay. Andrew, now I'll ask the question, the importance <laughs> of a classical education. <laughs> and, and I won't segue on the segue segue. <laughs> we'll see. All right. I'll, answer, I'll answer the question posed. Yeah, so a, a classical education, Dale, you said at the beginning that we, we really strive for this happiness, right? So in finding the whole truth of something, we find happiness as well. And I think that's a beautiful movement that we see that you don't, you don't get happiness directly, right? You, you can't 
buy happiness, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation, right? There's certain things that might make you happy, but um, they're things. So we really need to um, find out what it is that we're called to do and to live and to be these free people who are in search of truth, embracing the truth, encountering truth and loving truth. And then we will find happiness, right? And that's what a classical liberal arts education is. It's, it's the arts, it's the skills that a free person needs to acquire. Now in classical society, they, they meant um, free as in not a slave, as an aristocratic, right? So it, it meant something different, but I think um, we're not stretching it too far to take it analogously in the Christian sense of, you know, to being a person who's free spiritually um, to live that moral life, right? Through the intellectual formation and the spiritual formation, we can make those moral choices. And so the, the classical education focuses on those skills that we need to develop in order to be a free person. And in encountering the truth in this way, we will encounter happiness. Um, so, and that's the joy of being a, a teacher in a classical environment, is that you're showing them truth, the students are falling in love with truth, and then they find happiness, which is elusive for high school students sometimes. I mean, yeah. you get quite the opposite of happiness. And in fact, you know, our families, they're wonderful and they have the family dinner and they do everything right. And still the children come in and it amazes me, you know, a 14 year, 14 year old can come in and somewhere deep in them is this notion that fundamental, fundamentally, they don't deserve to be loved. It's really, it's, it's shocking and it, it's so, it's sad it, because when you tell them that God loves them, they, they get it, right? That they, they, they understand that God loves them, but that they are, that they don't have to earn anyone's love, that they are, that they are beautiful in themselves and worthy of, of love. Um, you really have to work hard to get them to see that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the journey that we take them on. It's not so much a journey of telling them God loves you, it's that you were made to be loved by God. That's beautiful. Um, you know, I can tell you, um, in regards to what you just said before that about uh, when they discover that, that virtue is connected to happiness, which is what they, you start with that in ninth grade uh, philosophy at mm -hmm. Chesterton. I, we have personally seen kids just get excited yeah. when, they, when they make that connection for the first time. And then it's not coming from Sunday school. It's not coming from the pulpit. It's coming from a Greek philosopher, 3,000 years old, who made the connection. And it, it is a timeless truth that all of a sudden hits them right now. And uh, I, I, we have seen, I've seen that transformation take place. When they, first, when they realize that their thoughts can be ordered is what happens in mm -hmm. philosophy. But then when they realize what that great classical truth that, that virtue is connected uh, to happiness. It's a um, paradox, right? Like, yeah, it you is. have to let happiness go. Yeah. You have to stop trying to grab happiness yeah. and instead do the right thing. Right. right. And then happiness will follow. If you are good, you will be happy. Now tell mm -hmm. me some of, the, some of the effects that you've seen uh, as a result of teaching this curriculum. Uh, and, and as a result, both at, both at your school, Andrew, and, and also you know, across the network, if, 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 if you know of any stories you could add. Yeah, so it, it is a privilege to be involved in this journey that the kids are on. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. And every now and then you get a glimpse of the journey and it's just beautiful. But there are different, so we, we talked about those different elements, right? The spiritual and the intellectual and the moral formation. And you see the students being touched at different times in different ways on those different levels. So every now and then you'll, you'll see something that's transformative for a student that um, really changes the course of their life that's academic. So I, I remember some students coming in and they were in severe need of remediation. Um, you know, our program, um, the Chesterton program that we have at our arts diocesan school markets itself as an advanced honors program, you know, so, but we let anyone in who's motivated to do well. And we had some students come in and they were completely deficient in grammar. And here we go freshman year with this um, really thorough, rigorous writing program that starts at the, at the basis and really builds up on the writing skills from there. And 
I worked with these two young ladies and at the beginning they couldn't identify a noun from a verb. That's where we, I got a sixth grade workbook and I, I photocopied some sheets and we did some noun and verb um, uh, exercises. And from there they started writing their essays and they started developing. And um, I, I'm gonna give you, they flourished, but don't take my word for it. Let me give you a concrete metric, right? So. Um, at the beginning of ninth grade, the kids take the PSAT. And um, then again, they, they do it again in, in 10th grade. And the college board who puts out the PSAT, they, they have a chart and they say a normal amount of growth is 50 points. So if you get 100 points, that means you've done two academic years worth of growth in that one year. Well, one of those girls because of, I, I'm, I'm convinced, it was because of the philosophy class and because of the writing, she had 200 points worth of growth from ninth grade to 10th grade. That's four academic years. Now her score in ninth grade was really low and her score in 10th grade, even though it grew so much, you know, was just getting into that average range, but that's, it's life-changing for her. And now she's graduated and she told me while that was happening freshman year she, and when we were doing the rhetoric, she's like, you know what, I, I have a voice and I'm going to become a lawyer. <laughs> and, and now she's pre-law. Right? <laughs> so, it, it, I mean, when you talk about, oh yeah, this is our writing program, it, it, it sounds kind of maybe dull, right? Not to me because I get super excited about curriculum, but I, I understand for most people it's not, but it's, it's really a program that teaches them a skill and gives them a confidence that allows them to make that choice, right? So it's, it, I, I was saying, you have to overcome the self doubt that they have. And this was an example for me of, of um, academic self doubt that just got obliterated by the curriculum, right? And emerged this wonderful confident young lady who's just like i know what i want to do and so it's beautiful um that that's a, that's academic growth good what one more question before we, we move oh, on come on i don't get to talk about spiritual and, and moral growth too can i give you one more story no, yeah. can, I, can i give you two more stories <laughs> oh, one more story one more story okay yeah. all right then, then well, you can segue back to the third story okay very good we'll do that later on um, so, um, the, the point of the Chesterton curriculum in the Chesterton academies in the Chesterton programs in Chesterton Coryezu is to create these environments where students can fall in love with Christ. That's the goal. And you're kind of like, oh, okay, that's a great goal. How do you do that? And then we show them a stack of books and they're like, that doesn't, how does that translate into creating an environment that, and so once you, once you start to learn the curriculum and the, and the vantage point with which we teach these things, you start to see it unfold and, and it's really beautiful, but, but it works. That's the crazy thing, right? It works. And these kids do encounter Christ during their high school years. And um, so I always in, in charge of orientation. Now I have a program within a, a larger school. So I have about 10% of the students in the school, but I'm in, I help out with the orientation for the entire school. And the, the, the part that um, the chaplain asked me to, to do is to hold a small group session with the, with the um, freshmen during orientation and to encourage them to think about when are you going to meet Christ during high school? I know you've thought about the sports and I know you've thought about the friends. You might've thought about the classes, but have you, have you thought about when you're going to encounter Christ? And, you know, I can talk and, you know, who am I? I'm, I'm this, you know, older guy. So I always let the students do this part of the presentation. And I use the students in, in my program and uh, they're wonderful and they're fantastic and they, they always do a great job. So I didn't really prep with them. I was just like, all right, so this is what we're gonna do, show a little video. And then I want you to witness to the importance of meeting Christ in high school. And they got up there and they told personally the moment that it happened, two of them. And I was there for both of those moments. And I had to, I had to leave the room. I was, I was a mess. You know, it's just like, it, it, it works. It really works. It's, it's an environment where they encounter the love of Christ and you, and you get to realize that you were there at the most important moment of their life. This is when it all changes. 
right? And the fact and the honor that you get to be there for that and to witness that. Um, and I didn't know that it had happened. Like I, I didn't know that what the stories that they were going to tell, and I didn't know that it happened. So when they when they mentioned these stories, I was just like, it's it's really overwhelming. It's, it's overwhelming. Wait. You know, Andrew, I'd like you to tell the, your third story. I can I can segue my last question to a point later on in the program. So <laughs> tell your third story. All right. So w let's talk about moral, right? So we talked yep. about academic, spiritual, moral. Um, we have students and, you know, they, they come from these great families. And so one Holy Thursday, the mom said to um, one of my students, her sister, and another one of my students who was a friend who was with them. So three young girls and the mom, you know, it's Holy Thursday before mass tonight. How about we go pray at the abortion clinic? Um, this was not a rare occurrence for them. They said, sure. So e just that fact is, is really beautiful in terms of the moral formation, right? Um, so they went and then a, a man started to harass them and um, videotape them, shaming them, and tried to dox the, um, the girls, the young girls, the, the teenagers, the, the ones who are students in my program. And so in case you don't know the word dox, and I didn't know it before I heard this story, it's to find out their names and their addresses and to publish it so that the shaming can go on, right? So this happened and, and the video didn't really do much, but that same gentleman who ends up being a PA state representative, a Pennsylvania state representative, Brian Sims, um, he did that again to an elderly lady a few weeks later. And because of that, both videos surfaced and they went viral. Hmm. And these two students are, are students in, in the program and the witness that they gave by not, so, he was trying to find out their identity. So, um, you know, Students for Life counseled us that it's best for them to, to stay back. Now, these three young ladies, I mean, they, they are descendants of Joan of Arc. They wanted to get out there and they wanted to um, really share their message. And um, it was hard to, to, to keep them back, but it, it was the prudent thing to do. And um, their parents went out uh, instead, but they gave such w beautiful witness. And, that that's great. Um, I, I think the whole story really shows the moral formation that they're they're getting at the school. But the point that stuck with me is that when they were in school, all of their kids in the Chesterton, all the kid, their classmates in the Chesterton program, they were all just like, dude, that was the coolest thing ever. Ooh. You know, it's just, I mean, it, it was it was beyond support, it was admiration. Whereas they might have been ridiculed or, or something at, at a different school or institution, it was just sort of way to go, fist pump, you know? Um, so the, the camaraderie that they have and the shared values that they have and the, and the reinforcement that they get from each other is just beautiful to see. Well, that, that is uh, a great story. <laughs> I'm glad you told it right now. We're going to talk to Nancy Brown for just a little bit here, and then we're going to, we want to take questions from, uh, from people who uh, are viewing us tonight. Uh, we already have a few questions, but uh, Nancy, a few nuts and bolts questions uh, for you, please. Uh, you know, there, I think we want to make it clear that uh, there are Chesterton academies all around the country. If there's one close to people, they should register at that one if they are interested in this type of education. Uh, but for those who don't have access to those uh, schools, who aren't living close to a, a school, we have developed this core YESU program, a homeschool uh, online uh, way of delivering the curriculum. How, do we, how does a per person go about doing that? Well, let's start there with the, um, the schools network. So. Yeah. Let's go, if we go online and we go to the chestertonschoolsnetwork.org, we're going to see a listing there on the right, it says schools. So the first thing that I recommend is for people to go there and see if there is possibly a school near you. We do have 30 schools now in the U.S., um, there, uh, 33 if you count the world, and uh, more are being added all the time. So the best thing is if you can live, if you live within driving distance of a school, 
to let that school be your school and, and become part of that family. That's the best way to get that sense of community and that sense of belonging and everything. But for a lot of people, even though we have that many schools, they're just not within driving risk reach of those schools or they 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 want to start up a school. This is another option. So you find out about Chester Academy and you think, oh my gosh, this is what I want. I want to start a school, but it takes a little while to start up a school. And so perhaps that is in, in your future to start a Chesterton Academy, but it can't start right now. So if those, those are your, um, your situations, Coryezu may be right for you. So what Coryezu is, is an online version of a Chesterton Academy. So what we're doing is, um, so if you go again to Chesterton Schools, network.org and you click on the right on the left where it says online you'll get a lot more information we have videos we have downloads you can you can get the ninth grade books the tenth grade books um, and, and watch some of the videos on the on there they're they're absolutely beautiful made me cry when i watched through them <laughs> the other day um, so we want to create a sense of community even with our online family so what we're doing is we're inviting those parents who feel they really would like this kind of education, the kind of education that Andrew just talked about, that classical education that really emphasizes the good, the beautiful, the true, um, the, the kind of education where we're, we, we want to not just academically make these kids, you know, really strong, but we want them to get to heaven. That's, that's our goal as parents. Um, so how can we form that character? How can we form their hearts so that they want that for themselves. That's the most important thing. So I would recommend really that you um, just peruse that website. Um, if you are already signed up, thank you. We, we really appreciate that. And we're looking forward to um, being a part of your journey with you this school year. But if you haven't yet, um, you go again to that online button and there's a button that says register and you'll just click on that. And the first step is to fill out a little bit of information. And there's a $100 de deposit that we ask you for. And once you do that, the whole ball will start rolling. So there's, there's some forms that you fill out. And then um, the next step, and we hope to get this out on Monday for you, is um, all of your materials, your information, how you pay your tuition, um, welcome letter from your head, new headmaster, which is Andrew. Youngblood and all of that. So it, I know that people have questions because some of you on here have already signed up and we really thank you for that. And we're looking forward to getting you that information. Um, we are just working as hard as we can to get that out and get it ready for you. So um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. Well, that's very helpful, very yeah. helpful. Um, here's a question though about homeschooling that came in from, from one of our viewers tonight. Is there any kind of option for homeschooling for students when both their parents are working? I've never had that one tossed across the plate before. Sure. You know, that, it is a challenge um, because, you know, most children need supervision at some level. Um, with our Core Yezu program, there are going to be live classes, which, you know, the students will be taking at that certain time. And then there are what we call asynchronous classes, which are recorded classes. And those actually, they could be watched in the evening if the parents wanted to watch with that student. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know of anything specifically. I think you would, you would have to plan to, if let's say just you took um, some generic online program, you'd have to plan on assigning your child what they would do during the day while you're at work. And then in the evening, when you come home, make sure they did it. That's what I would do if it were me. Yeah, that, and I, I think there may, be, uh, there may be other concerns about having a completely unsupervised student too. So Absolutely, yeah. You probably have to be involved with some kind of community of some kind where the, where the student could be during the day. Right. But uh, yeah, that is, that's a question I've never heard before. So I have, mm -hmm. uh, have to do some more thinking about that one. Can I, can I just jump in from an Absolutely. actual standpoint? The, um, the Chesterton Coryezu will provide everything that the student needs. 
And I always find that it's a good touchstone to make sure that the students are working independently. So we invite the parents to participate in the education, not because the student needs the assistance, but because it creates this beautiful bond between them. So I, I wanna make that distinction. The child, it, under normal circumstances, you would wanna see the child be able to do all the work independently. Now that's for just the intellectual standpoint, right? You know, from the moral and the, and the social standpoint, whether or not they should be by themselves, that, that's a different issue. Uh, we just had a question about uniforms. Are uniforms required in a school supply list? Each individual brick and mortar school uh, usually requires uniforms, uh, we, we encourage it. Uh, and of course there's supply lists for, for those schools. Now for a homeschool student, you get to determine what the uniform is as a parent. You, uh, and you should have, have a sense of discipline for your student. It's very, it's very good that, um, that they do have a sense of discipline and, and what they wear encourages that sense of discipline. They can focus more uh, when, uh, when they're not distracted even by how comfortable they have to be. It's, it's an interesting paradox there. Uh, here's another question that came in. Um, and I think this is a, this is a very interesting question. Um, someone asked, should public schools be defunded? And uh, I, I would, I'm, I'm no stranger to controversy, nor am I one who likes to shy away from controversy. Um, but I will say that, and I've already gone on record as saying this, that the rioting that is taking place around the country is really a result directly of our public school system. We can thank our public school system for the social unrest that we're experiencing today. I think that the results of, of, of a public education system in this country have been a uniform disaster. And, I'm, and that is not a criticism of good teachers in the public school system. It's not a criticism of good students and good parents. It is a system that is fundamentally flawed because it is not allowed to teach the truth. It's not allowed to teach the whole truth of things. It's not allowed to teach almost everything that is needed to be taught are, is forbidden from being taught. And that includes both faith and reason. We don't teach the things that matter in our schools and we are looking at the results all around us of students who have been cheated out of an education at the most important time in their lives. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the public schools system should, uh, should not be sucking up any more of public dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I can't be accused of not feeling strongly about that. <laughs> Theo, can I segue back to um, our former question about that child who might be homeschooled alone. Uh, I just thought of something where we are encouraging families uh, to gather together for Koryezu. So if that's an option, if you have other parents near you who are like-minded and would want to gather, you could take the class, the, your children could take the classes together and perhaps that child whose parents both have to work could be under the supervision of, of your friend's household for that day. Um, that's an option. Just wanted to throw that out there. Good. Thank you. Uh, we mm -hmm. just also had a question about the academy, the present academies, are they open for live school instruction or online? Um, most of the schools right now are open in person and, but they're providing an online option uh, for students who cannot attend for one reason or another, which We've developed a hybrid program here in the Twin Cities and other schools are implementing the same thing because we had to all go online. We all became homeschoolers, as Andrew pointed out uh, a few months ago. Uh, but now, you know, we've, we've just been looking forward to the chance to get back into the classroom. There certainly are restrictions. It's, there are these challenges, but we have made it available so that uh, students who uh, cannot attend for one reason or another, certainly if they're, if they're ill, 
can take uh, the class uh, live online and see the teacher in class and, and get the instruction. Uh, and so really there's, we, we are now, thanks to COVID, there's no reason to ever miss school. <laughs> can't call in snow, day, snow days are gone. <laughs> call in and be part of class from your call in. It's, it's great. It's a great system. <laughs> All right. Um, someone asked about uh, boarding. I don't know where they, where they live, but they, they wanted to attend the Twin Cities school and uh, in, in person and and uh, see if there was a boarding situation. We have, I can tell you, we have in the Twin Cities have had students from out of state attend, but they usually live with a relative or something um, in order to attend the school. We, we don't provide a boarding option as it were, but we certainly do accommodate out of state students who are living he here and just for the purpose of attending the school. But you, you'd have to really make your own uh, boarding arrangements, as it were, we suggest with a friend or a relative. We we don't set that that up, uh, but that we have done that virtually every year we've been open. We have out of state students attending the school, but it might be possible to yeah. attend a Ch Chester Academy more cl closer to where you live. Dale, can we take this opportunity and just do a little plug for our friends over at St. Martin's Academy in Fort Scott, Kansas? Oh, Would thank you for bringing that up. I, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that there are, are other schools. Uh, of, it might have been right before you came online, uh, Amy. But but if there if there's one school I'd like to plug for for people who would like to think about boarding their student in another uh, city, there is an all boys boarding school in Fort Scott, Kansas, that has a marvelous classical. Catholic curriculum, St. Martin's Academy, uh, but it also has an agrarian slash rural component. So your young man will not only be studying Plato and Aristotle, he'll be feeding hogs and chickens and learning how to uh, grow things. And uh, it's, it's, Amy and I are both very familiar with that school, cannot say enough good things about it. And, and for the parents who are asking about, well, where's the girls school? Currently, there isn't a girls boarding school that we know of, but I have the plans for one. I call it St. Joan of Arc Academy, and someday it's on my dream list to create one. So you'll just have to wait for now. So you can send your, uh, your child to high school there when she is 26 years old. <laughs> that school started. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions here. Um, There's a question in the Q&A box, Dale, about I, what- I do, hang on one second, let me oh, take that yeah, one. See. Uh, what constitutes a hybrid option? Uh, uh, is it two to three days of school? Also, are you providing material for distance learning to your network of schools? Well, um, uh, the, the distance learning materials that we provide are, is the Chesterton Coriesu. I, I believe that's the, the answer to that question. The hybrid option is, um, is of course up to every parent who does homeschool. If, if you use the Chesterton Coriesu uh, curriculum, it is a complete curriculum. If you decide to, to not use all of it, um, you know, you are the primary educator. We can't take away that option from you, but we do provide a complete curriculum with the Chesterton Coriesu program. And because it's an integrated program, it does work best if you, if you're involved in the whole thing, the whole day. Yeah. 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 It, it, the, that it, the integration is really important because mm -hmm. really what you're studying in, uh, in literature is connected to what you're studying in history, but it's even connected to what you're studying uh, in the in the other uh, edge of the curriculum with the with the math and the sciences because the the level of development is is all connected to this to the, the whole truth of things yeah the whole truth of things <laughs> Amy they want to know if St Joan of Arc is going to be in Kansas City well, oh no they're they're inviting they're inviting you to start it in Kansas City <laughs> I've thought about that area so who knows okay. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. That could be that that could be a uh, a message from the Holy Spirit <laughs> appearing 
in this case as Matt Kutz there. <laughs> you know, can I just, can I just um, circle back to the Chesterton Schools Network and just do a little celebration of the growth. You mentioned 12 years ago, 10 students. When I came on board um, with the Regina Chesterton Academy at Cardinal O'Hara High School, that was five years ago and there were 12 schools this past year, there were 18 schools, and I believe Nancy already said that this, this year, in 2020, no less, we will be opening more than 30 schools um, around the country, in Canada, one in Italy. And, um, and Amy, b before you start St. Joan of Arc, remember, we, we need to start a school in Erbil, Iraq. Next, in, in 2021, the Archbishop of Erbil, Iraq has asked us to... Uh, to found a school there as well. So the growth that happened with those 10 miserable, from those 10 miserable students around the one table has really been, you know, apostolic in nature. <laughs> Truly indeed, indeed. Yes. Uh, here's a question, Andrew, talk about how do you do music online? So one of the, the one of the great parts about Chesterton Corriers is that we're able to leverage the phenomenal teaching staff that we have so we're drawing from our seasoned veteran teachers um, throughout the network. And, and also, I mean, throughout the network, not just in the United States, but also in Canada. So we have amazingly talented teachers. And one of the great joys for me is that we get to give a, a larger platform to these phenomenal teachers. So our music teacher is Dr. Josh Russell, who uh, I'm going to mess up his credentials, but it, let, I'm just going to cut to the chase and say it's amazingly impressive. He has a PhD doctorate. in piano performance. Yes, and he gotcha. for 10 years at a, at a college, at a university, right? Yeah. And he's a, uh, a concert level pianist um, performing with symphonies. I'm, amazing, it's yeah. just amazing. And he is a, a phenomenal headmaster um, at his school in Illinois. And um, we, are, we are thrilled to be able to share him with the network. Now, you can't, we won't be able to do choral music, but people will be able to learn choral pieces because again, one of the, one of the great experiences that we have in the Chesterton schools is when we come together, different schools, and we have the same body of music that we can share. So learning these pieces, um, th there won't be a, a full choral experience like there would be in a Chesterton Academy, but there will be learning of these pieces. So when they come together, when they go on the Rome pilgrimage, when they're getting together with students after the March for Life um, from different Chesterton Academies, they can break out into um, polyphonic song and just really celebrate the unity and the camaraderie of, of the curriculum. Yeah, true. Good point. Uh, we just got a message uh, from our good friend Del Teeter in uh, who lives outside of Madison. And uh, if, for those of you who haven't heard, uh, the county of Dade County uh, has just right before the schools were planning on opening this fall, uh, forbidden public, uh, forbidden even the private schools to meet um, in person for their classes. And uh, devastating news, they are they filed a lawsuit uh, against the county for it, but uh, a great struggle. And as Dell pointed out, it is it is spiritual warfare there. So please pray for our friends uh, at Am St. Ambrose Academy, another great classical school. Um, and uh, we are all together in this in this fight. Uh, it's it's in many ways there there will be things that get worse before they get better. But it's going to always keep getting better at the same time because we really are armed against this with uh, with what we're doing right now, and we are really blessed to have each other. A great core of group of, of people who are, have come together to to serve uh, your students and to to create uh, what we're calling the next greatest generation. So uh, thank you all for being part of it. Please continue to. To, to be in touch with us and, and contact us with, with your questions and any way we can help, we certainly will. I wanna thank our, our fellow panelists, uh, Nancy, Andrew, and Amy for being part of this tonight. And keep, let's pray for our country, let's pray for our students, and let's pray for each other. All right, good night. <laughs>